live from the mist and shrouded mountaintop fortress that is X and Y Communications Headquarters. You're listening to the world famous Mountaintop Podcast. And now, here's your host, Scott McKay. Hey, hey, this is your man, Scott McKay, and I welcome you to yet another episode of the world famous Mountaintop Podcast. Today, I've got a new friend of mine. His name is Dave Elliott, and get this, he's from Baltimore, Maryland. So he is a fellow Baltimorean, which I'm excited about. And he is the founder of Legendary Love for Life. He's a relationship coach, and he has lots of very interesting ideas about aspects of relating and dating and mating that not a lot of other people typically give much thought to. One of his ideas of many that caught my eye is a certain modality that he has surrounding predicting relationships that will last. And he calls that the always method. So without anything further, from Baltimore, Maryland, my new friend, Dave Elliott. Dave, welcome to the show, man. Hey, thanks, Scott. I'm really glad to be here. Always a pleasure to spend some time with a fellow Baltimorean. Yeah, man. And we won't bore everybody with the Ravens. No, nothing to be bored about. No, that's right. <laughs> we'll move on. This is not a football podcast. With apologies to you Cowboys fans out there from Texas, my fellow Texians. Uh, anyway, the important part here is you talk about relationships in a very down to earth, visceral manner that I really appreciate. It's kind of fluff free. It tells it like it is, which is what I'm always about. And always the acronym actually with two L's, right? A L L W A Y S is the centerpiece of our discussion today. Why don't you give these guys a little bit of a primer on what always is all about, Dave? Yeah, I'd love to, man. So always, I basically came up with this. There's a kind of a little bit of a cool story that starts with it. Uh, Several years ago, I was approached by a local uh, Fox television affiliate uh, because there was a newsworthy story about relationships in the news. It was when uh, Kim Kardashian got divorced after 72 days, and they thought that was pretty newsworthy. And they asked me to come on and talk about, you know, as a relationship coach, what does this mean and what can we do about this? And and my response was, I'm happy to come on and I'm happy to talk about it, but I don't know these people. I haven't spoken to them, so I really couldn't speak with any uh, authority about their issues. So I said, what I can do is I can make this a teachable moment. And I created this thing that I call, you know, the always formula. And I add an additional L because I came up with this little acronym about, you know, what are some values that will help people consider prior to taking the plunge is like, is this a a union that is likely to stand the test of time? You know, my company is called Legendary Love for Life. So what's the difference between a relationship that could be pretty good and one that might, you know, be a lifetime worthy? And so I created this always acronym, A-L-L-W-A-Y-S. And basically, uh, these are a couple of things that I said you should take a look at and consider before making the leap and deciding that you think you can spend a lifetime with this person. So I created this acronym to help people um, keep track of it and consider. Well, we're going to definitely dive into that acronym. Uh, But before we do so, I'm tempted to ask, so I am going to ask it, why do you think people can date and decide that the right thing to do is to go ahead and get married? And then it's as if marriage wrecks the relationship. I mean, I've known people who have dated for like four or five years and then they get married and they're divorced within certainly like six months, some relatively short window of time. What's going on there? I mean, is it cohabitation that ruins it? Is it the commitment and perhaps the societal pressure on marriage that throws a wrench in the works? What's your take on that? Mm, That's a great question. I think there's a couple of different answers. One, I would say sometimes there are people that do have some commitment issues and the thought of a marriage, uh, making something permanent, that word permanent might have some stuff attached to it. I I think that could be a huge factor. I mean, because that's the principal difference between someone who's been together five years and then, you know, everything's going relatively well. And then within six months, they're pulling the plug on it. I would say that there's something there about the belief or the ideal behind what marriage is and what it isn't, and the lack of freedom or flexibility or whatever. And then I think the other thing is simply put, I think everyone comes into your life for a reason, a season or a lifetime. They're going to teach you something about yourself show you something about yourself. I think that relationships are probably one of the deepest dives in our own personal development. And the the reason I say is because I think people come into your lives to show you aspects and that you don't see those aspects unless um, 
you know, there's someone else there. Like, I don't know there's a splinter on the edge of my desk unless I brush up against it. Or, you know, I don't know that, you know, it really pisses me off when someone leaves the cap off the toothpaste unless someone leaves the cap off the toothpaste. So, like, you literally people show you these things and you don't know they're an issue if you live by yourself. So, you know, I think other people in your general living space and, you know, cohabitating and living day to day, that's where you start to learn these things that either bug you or you love. And what's the difference between them? Yeah, without a doubt, long term relationship shines a vicious spotlight on all the flaws that the two of you share or individually bring to the table. Yeah, perceived or real. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And I can't help but think, however, about the stereotype that once women get a ring on their finger and the marriage happens and they get an I do, they just let everything slide. They gain a hundred pounds. They stop being nice. And you know, certainly that's not gender specific. Men can let things slide. The real version of them can come out if they have the woman in a marriage relationship or, you know, some guys in a manipulative way will knock a woman up pretty quickly into the relationship. So now she's pregnant and there's no way out. And then he starts abusing her. That's all tied collectively to a phenomenon that really scares a lot of people away from long-term commitment, especially the marriage relationship to begin with. But in some ways, it's very real. People walk down the aisle and then they just let everything slide. They get a little lazy with the relationship. They get a little lazy with themselves, with their ambition. They feel like, okay, well, you know what? The heavy lifting's done. I've crossed the finish line. Now I can just relax. And I think that's got to be up there with the major killers of long-term relationships, right? Yeah, I I think you're right. I mean, that's why dating is so important. I mean, really, there there can be a power dynamic involved in there, as you're saying about like who's got the power, who's lost it, who who says yes, who says no, who's fully in, who backs out. There's a lot of power in that, and so I think that when you date someone long term, you get a chance to see them. My belief is, if you see them over a few seasons. Um, you're going to see all that stuff and you're going to pick up on that. You're going to pick up on the ones who are, you know, just short term trying to cross the finish line and get to the goal and who's, you know, who's being authentic and who they are and just real. I think you get a better chance of catching that when you spend a, a few different seasons with someone and you see them over time. You really start to get a feel for who people are. People, I think people can be duplicitous and like hide that stuff about who they are. Uh, in smaller bursts. But I think over time, you know, people mostly reveal themselves. You know, going along with what you're saying, I've talked about this on the show before, but it's been quite a while. My favorite tip for making sure you're actually ready to take the next step of a long-term committed relationship is to take a road trip together. Like fly out to Phoenix Sky Harbor Airport, rent a car and drive around Arizona for like a long four-day weekend. After all that windshield time, if you're not at each other's throats and can't stand each other, you're probably going to be able to get along. If you can spend that much time dealing with all the hassles and being tired and being cranky and hangry and all those and things. And Arizona heat together. too. <laughs> oh yeah, exactly. Especially if it's hot. I'm reminded of the Spike Lee movie, Do the Right Thing, where everybody's getting really angry and particularly edgy and violent with each other because it's the hottest day of the year in New York. Yeah, heat definitely does something to you. But, you know, Arizona be darned. If you spend four days of windshield time with someone, the flaws in your personality, the flaws in your overall compatibility are going to come out. They're going to rear their ugly heads. So that's just a tip that I like. But anyway, I want to get on to your always method and break that down. So uh, go ahead, man. Let's have it. What's the A? Great. Uh, so the A, the first one stands for your aspirations and dreams. So aspirations is basically, you know, what do you want your life to look like? You know, uh, what do you believe that life is about? What do you want to become? What do you want to do? Where do you want to live? In your mind's eye, what is the ideal for you? I mean, the thing is, if you... You know, if you marry someone like uh, you love travel and your other person is a homebody, then that all, you know, at some point there's going to be a huge disconnect, you know, and I, and I talk about these things where it's like you, you want to make sure that your idea of a great life and their idea of a great life are, you know, uh, are compatible, that you guys want similar things. They don't have to be identical. They just have to be complementary. You got to be able to find a win-win because both people, you know, you're, you're, in a, you're tethered into a relationship and your idea of success is like, again, if we use the example of travel, if you love to travel and the other person wants to stay home and every time you leave, they see it as a problem in the relationship, 
And that's not really going to be sustainable. At some point, something's going to come up and it's just going to, it's going to be problematic to say the very least. At some point, it's going to be the thing that kills everything because they're just too far apart. Yeah. I dated a woman one time who was deathly afraid of flying. Obviously, that wasn't going to fly, pun intended. Yeah. But I'll tell you what, when people lack options in their dating life, when they finally find someone who will quote unquote put up with them, a lot of times those people are very afraid to dig into what's underneath the surface with each other. Therefore, talks about what do you want for the future? What are your aspirations? What are your goals? Really take a back seat to Netflixing and chilling again innocuously for the 400th time without really getting to know each other. Because once you get to know each other, you may find things that are deal breakers. And one of them that tends to jump out pretty early in the process is, you know, you and I are in completely separate paths in life and this isn't really going to work out. So I'm glad you brought that up. And I think it's amazing actually that you put it first. Uh, what's the first L? So the very first L, it's a little bit tricky because I put two of them in there, always stay together always, but then there's all kinds of ways to stay together. Um, I put the second, the first L in there is links to family, because I think that's really important. There are some people, you know, their link to their nuclear family is, is critical. They're really, really close to their family. And there's some people, their links to their family are problematic. Like they might be totally estranged. They might not have good relationship with family at all. And they might not really want to be connected to your family. So if you're really close to your family and you can't even conceive of a holiday that doesn't have, you know, a big guest table with 40 people around it and in your new, you know, partner in life is like, no, I just want it to be the two of us. Why do we have to have all that? That's not going to fly long term. I think it's really important to decide, you know, what do you want your holidays to look like and what do you... How often are you going to see your family? What's it going to look like? Are you close to them? Are you, are you, do, are other people welcoming to your family? Are they, or are they going to say, I'm really close to my family. You're really close to your family. We're, maybe they, they're going to fight over who spends time with whose family, you know? So these kind of links, they really need to, again, they don't have to be identical. They have to be complementary. You need to be able to find a workable way, uh, where again, it gets back to the key formula is win-win. How do both people get enough? So links to family, incredibly important. Yeah, I think a lot of people in relationships, and typically it's one of the partners, if not both, are trying to run away from the simple truth that when you marry someone, you marry their whole family. Absolutely. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, if you can't stand her kids, if she's a single mom, you're going to have to deal with those kids, not only until they're out of the nest, but visiting after that, basically for the rest of your life. Her parents, her siblings, everybody who's obnoxious, who's close to her, you're going to have to weigh whether you can handle the obnoxious nature of the relatives as a trade-off for having her in your life. And you know what? There's no going back on that decision-making later. You know who you've got. You know that you made the decision to get into a relationship with a woman despite who else is in her family, and there's no complaining about it later. You're going to have to sit down and deal with it. I mean, you have to find a way to relate to those people on term, and if those relationships can improve or if they work on themselves and make improvements, that's great. That's a bonus. But really, you are going to be tied to her family and vice versa. And I would also extend that to pets. I mean, you can't say, all right, look, I'd love to marry you, but you got to get rid of these three cats or you got to get rid of that dog that I'm allergic to. I mean, if she decides she wants to do that and presents that as an option, great. But if you're presenting all these caveats that she's not really game for, then you're just breeding resentment into the relationship instead of puppies. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Or if you marry someone and they got their three big dogs on the bed, you really want to live the rest of your life without getting a decent night's sleep ever again, if you know, that's a bit of a deal breaker for you. So yeah, this is why this stuff is so incredibly important. You know, and you know, they're going to make a choice between their pets and you again, that's another that's your fur family, you know, right. rather than your family family. Right. I mean, and this is all about compatibility. And it's kind of like when someone has a feature of their life, whatever it is, that's very important to them. And it's not important at all, or carries very little weight with the other person. The latter person is going to try to dissuade the former person from having that part of their life be so important. And often they're very successful at it. I mean, I'm thinking of people who, for example, have spiritual reasons that they want to save sex until marriage. And then they end up in a relationship with someone who has no problem with having lots of sex before marriage. And 
the person without the spiritual issue with premarital sex is constantly trying to help the other person out of feeling like they got to save themselves for marriage. Kind of the same way. If I don't want dogs and I don't want pets or I don't care about the cats at all, I'm going to think, hey, you know, it shouldn't be a big deal for her to suddenly stop caring about the dogs and cats also. But, you know, that's an unreasonable and, dare I say, manipulative expectation. you got to take people as they come, and you're either going to be compatible with them or not, right? Absolutely, yeah. Really important. Yeah. What's the other L? So the second L is about lifestyle and health. Again, you know, people have a basically, you know, they have a mindset or a, like a fixed set of expectations. It's really about expectations in life. You know, you know, can a can a gym junkie who has to work out six days a week or seven days a week, or or someone who wants to run ten miles a day, coexist with a junk food junkie who wants to like sit on the couch and and be a couch potato? You know, those are very different life styles and expectations. And again, you've got to believe that those two people, because of their lifestyle choices, are going to have very different experiences, you know, in terms of, you know, what's acceptable weight wise and what their bodies are going to look like or what their long term health is going to look like and who's going to be taking care of who in their older age or something like that. So it, again, they don't have to be identical, but they have to be complementary. They have to be you know, in the same ballpark? Do they have the similar expectations for what life's going to be like? You know, it's just another important area. You know, they're very, very different. Yeah. You know, this is a factor that has a ripple effect through various aspects of a relationship. And people don't realize it till again, they're in the relationship actually living with each other. Like, yeah, okay, cool. She's a vegan, no problem. And I'm a meditarian. Well, your dinner choices every night are going to have to be a compromise. Right. If you're not ready to go on a plant-based diet right now and you really don't want to give that up, you're going to have to basically come to the conclusion that, look, she's not going to start eating meat anytime soon. I can't force her to, which means if I'm eating meat, I'm doing it without her. Or in your example, too, you know, do you expect them to handle if the smell of meat in your house makes them nauseous? Do you expect them to prepare that for you or, you know, have you prepare it and then have that smell in the house? So like if it really, you know, they have a real reason why they're really, really against consuming meat of any kind, you know, and then again, it's just probably not compatible long term. And is it right or wrong? It's not about right or wrong. It's just about what works. Yeah, I mean, it could quite literally be a moral, ethical, or even spiritual issue for that person. And I know that's coming up, so I don't want to get ahead of ourselves. What's the W? Okay, the W is another really big one that I think breaks up a lot of couples, too. That's about the area of wealth and finance, you know. And again, I, they're sort of straw man arguments, but I get, basically I paint the picture and say, you know, what what happens when a, a spender and a saver get together? You know, someone someone who financial um, acuity or their interests in life, they're not necessarily – they're more of like, I want to go out and have a great time today, and they're going to prioritize experiences or things over saving for the future. And if every time you spend or go on a trip and the other person gets like this real nervous feeling about, oh, my God, we're spending a ton of money. What about our retirement? What about our future? You know, what's what's that going to look like? Again, you're creating pain for that other person, you know, whether it's you're the person that, you know, wants to go and spend and do it now or you're the person who's like, no, what about later? So, again, this whole now or later thing, you know, you guys have to sort of find a way to be on a, you know, on a comfortable trajectory saying, you're right. Maybe both are important. Maybe one's more important. Maybe two scrimpers can go and have fun eating their, you know, TV dinners together, knowing that they're saving a bunch of money for the future and they'll retire earlier than the other person. It's just about two people being on a similar page, you know. And wealth and finance is a really important one. It's one of the number one areas where, you know, couples fight about money, probably as much about that as any other topic. Well, I'm sure you've seen as many studies as I have that put financial matters as the number two cause of divorce behind infidelity. And some of those reports even put it number one. So, I mean, clearly this is huge. Yeah. And sometimes the wealth issue, a discrepancy can lead to an infidelity too, or vice versa. You know, they're very powerful ones. Those are definitely one and two, no doubt. Yeah. They can go hand in hand, like you said. One thing I want to address that's associated with this particular idea is how we as men can train our partner or certainly vice versa, right? 
while we're in the dating phase. For example, let's say I've got a lot of money and I like to flaunt it with women I date. So I go out and I attempt to buy their affection. I take them for surf and turf on date one and I take them on a shopping date on date two. And then we wake up a couple months later and somehow we're surprised that this woman really wants us to spend a lot of money on her and she's very materialistic and ties how much we're spending on her to the quality of the relationship itself. Then we marry her and we try to back off and go, hey, you know what? I, that was something I was doing during the courting phase. Now we're not going to spend any money anymore and I'm going to be more of a tightwad. And then are we supposed to be upset when she feels like a wrench has been thrown in her machine? But we as guys will complain about that. And then we fail to look in the mirror and realize we're the ones who established that trend. We established that precedent going forward in the relationship. Yeah, I think that life is sort of all about your your expectations and your results. So if your expectations and your results are, are in alignment, life is pretty good. If your expectations and your results are out of alignment, you have pain. And so in your example, it's a great example. Yeah, you've created the expectation. Here's what life with me is going to be like. And then if you pull back and you you change radically like that, you go from Mr. You know, good time Charlie to you know, <laughs> always on a budget Charlie, you've got a real problem because you've created a totally false – You know, they're going to feel like, hey, wait a minute. Who are you? I've never even met you. And so they're going to definitely feel like hey, there's a problem. You know, because you've showed up in a false way. And I think that's why authenticity and just knowing yourself is so Im important in dating. You know, if you don't know yourself, it's hard for you to give someone else a really good, solid understanding of who you are and what life is going to look like with you. Because, again, it's always about creating an expectation. Yeah, and that messes with her sense of safety and security, which, of course, is the kiss of death to both attraction and ultimately to the relationship. Yeah, that's a solid point for sure. What is the A? Okay, so here's it again. This is a little bit tricky to have an acronym with multiple L's and multiple A's, but the second right. A... This is the second A, right? Yeah, the second A in the formula is always faithful. And you, you talked about that a little bit earlier. Like if one person, you know, wants to be part of a throuple or have like, you know, multiple partners or that kind of thing, you know, you have to be on the same page. Is it just the two of us forever and always? Or is it someone who wants to be a little more experimental? Or is it someone who wants to have other people either separately or together? The people can have differences of opinion, but at least they have to be on the same page. You know, people have to decide like, yeah, I'm good with that. I'm signing up for a relationship where it says you and me, you know, for the rest of time. And if they're down with that and that's fine. But there are also couples that want to have, you know, they want to be swingers or something like that. And again, as long as as both people say, yep, that sounds good. Sign me up. Who's anyone else to judge? As long as the couple's happy. These are the terms that they've negotiated, and this is what they want to live consistent with. These are just important things. You can't marry someone and say, oh, wait, I didn't tell you. I'm really into swinging. I think we should do that. Like, that's, <laughs> that's totally unfair. You got to be on the same page going into it. Yeah, you know, I think this is one of the most widely ignored conversations that absolutely must take place prior to any commitment to a long-term relationship is, what does cheating mean to you? What does fidelity mean to you? And Couples absolutely have to be honest with each other about that. I mean, if a woman has jealousy issues, that's where that has to come out. She may think it's absolutely reasonable for her to have a draconian concept of locking down her husband and never talk to another woman again. Or a husband may say, now that you're pregnant, I don't want you to ever see any of your friends anymore. Don't ever leave the house. I know Emily has a friend who got married and her husband literally was not so about this stuff enough that he boarded up the windows. I mean, it just can get really crazy. And it's best if you have some kind of idea if those red flags exist up front. But more importantly, it's just good to know if you're on the same page insofar as what constitutes cheating. And another point you made that I think deserves underscoring is those goalposts can't move after you're in the relationship. If you were talking about not being swingers and being monogamous before you got married, two years into the relationship, you can't say, hey, you know what? I've decided we should be swingers instead. And you should uh, bring women around and we should have threesomes because you can't just expect your wife to go, oh, uh, sure. Is that what you want? Then I'm all in because it's not really going to happen that way. Once people have this mindset 
of what constitutes cheating, what kind of relationship they want, what defines that relationship. It's an unreasonable expectation that that's going to move and change with the wind or especially move and change because you want it to. Yeah. And you bring up a really great point, too, about the idea about in addition to like actual cheating, what else is considered cheating? Like, you know, uh, talking to friends or, you know, having people talk about this whole concept of emotional friends, you know, the friend at work who you're a little bit too chummy with. Or, you know, if you go out to lunch with a with a male or a female, depending on which, you know, which gender, is, is that a violation of some sort? You know, again, these are that uh, really important distinctions, too. you got to be on the same page. So, yeah, sometimes jealousies show up or or like like you said, situations change. Like he's a great example also of like, you know, if someone is having a baby or is that change things or, you know, there's a lot of just these little nuances and these little things that change. Some are predictable, some are not. Uh, but yeah, there's enough challenges. You know, we're going to change. You know, that's the one constant in life is change. You know, we're all going to get older. We're all going to change. And and to your point too, you might decide later on that maybe there's a conversation you can have if you, you know, you realize maybe there's something else that may be here for us. If you want to change, you could maybe have that conversation, but also you don't, you don't necessarily engage. You don't engage unless your other partner is up for it and they're changing at a similar pace and a similar interest and it's not done under duress. So that's possible too. But, you know, that's the thing. I, we sign up for a journey and we're all going to change and adapt over time. So, I mean, as long as it's not like we mentioned earlier, like you're kind of, it's a premeditated change. I'm going to do just what I have to do to make the sale. And as soon as I get it, now they're going to see the real me. That's a problem. <laughs> that's never going to work. Well, that's a lie. Yeah, absolutely. That in its own way is infidelity. That's a great cheating. point. Yeah. Great uh, point. Probably the most common issue that comes up when I talk to guys is the whole idea of a woman seeing internet porn as cheating. Because guys are like, oh my gosh, if you put naked women in front of me on the internet, I'm going to watch. And the woman says, well, if you do that, you may as well have gone out and screwed some other chick because that's how I see it. And that causes huge rifts in couples all the time. And many times guys are blindsided by that. They didn't see it coming, but that question was never talked about and that issue was never addressed. And so surprise, surprise. And of course, you know, you can tie that to jealousy issues. You can tie it to women just not understanding men, but whatever excuse you want to make, either pro or con, I mean, after all, some women watch porn with their husbands happily. It's something that had to have been discussed before you got into a committed relationship and found this out later. That's the bottom line. So what's the why? So the why, the next one is youth and children. This is another important area. It's like, do you want kids? Do you not want kids? How many do you want? What's the idea? Do you want three? Do you want two, boy and a girl? Do you, you know, what, what's the goal? And what do you, what are your expectations, you know, long term? Or do you, you a big believer in private school or do you think public school is just fine? Or do you need to move? Do you need to change where you are? Do you need to, you know, what, again, what are your beliefs about saving for college? Again, we start to bring in a little bit of the wealth and the finance aspect of it. So these things all sort of cross over and merge a little bit. But again, the, the one of the biggest uh, distinctions and like, are we going to get together for a lifetime or not? Yeah. Do you want kids or not? Is probably a really important part of it. You know, for some people, marriage is all about having kids. For others, it's like, whoa, whoa, hold on. I didn't sign up for this. You know, I just want to have someone to come home to at night. Right. So that's an important distinction. What, what does that look like? You know, is, is it fair to marry someone who always dreamed of having, you know, three kids in the white picket fence. And you're like, no way. I I want to live in the city and not have not have a fence or property to manage. I want to go out, you know, every night. You know, I don't want kids because that gets in the way. So these are just non-workable, you know, non-starters, essentially. And it's just important to have that discussion earlier rather than later. Yeah, well, I trust the importance of that particular issue speaks for itself with these guys. But I do want to bring up two ancillary points. First of all, if one of you already has children in your life, then someone you bring into your life as a significant other in that relationship, not only will those children impact that person's life, but vice versa. I mean, your kids will also have a stepdad, a stepmom. And we've all heard the stories, the nightmares about kids growing up suddenly confronted with the evil stepdad who abuses them and beats up mom and their entire lives are disrupted because mom, I'll dare say selfishly, wanted the wrong relationship because she was lonely. So not only the discussion of the kids we're going to potentially have or not have together needs to take place, but 
you know, if you've decided ahead of time that you do not want to date a single mom and you do not want to marry a single mom, then you've got to be true to yourself when you meet a woman who knocks you out, but she's got these two brats who you can't stand. Or else you have to face your own demons and say, well, you know, was I a little trigger happy with the opinion there that I didn't care to have someone else's kids in my life? It's a matter of sitting down, looking yourself in the mirror, and being truthful about that. And based also on another comment you made, I want to throw on the table this idea of younger guys wanting to date much younger women. I talked to guys who are 55, 60 years old, and they want a woman who's like 26, 28, because she's cute and she's spunky and hot and has a nice ass and stuff. And they want to marry her, and they want to have her make him a sandwich and bring him a beer and you know go all night in bed. And I'll almost always say to such a guy, well, you want to have more kids then, right? You're ready to be a dad again. And he's like, oh, hell no, man. My kids are both in their 20s. I'm done with that. I'm like, well, she's not going to be. She's going to be in her prime childbearing years, and she's going to want you to be a daddy. Well, that's not going to happen. Well, are you thinking about her? Are you taking that possibility even into consideration when you start thinking to yourself, hey, I'd love to have a 26-year-old hot piece of ass strutting around the house? And a surprising number of guys are myopic in that sense. They don't even consider that. It's like, yeah, you know, why don't you find a nice woman who's 36, 38 years old, and she's got a couple kids who are in their teens, and, you know, they'll be flying the nest here in a couple years, and then you can spend the rest of your life together. Or a woman who never had any kids, and she's already decided that. But, you know, you can't only think about yourself. You've got to be the kind of person that the woman of your dreams is also going to find to be the man of her dreams. Deserving what you want, right? Absolutely. That's a great point. Yeah. What's the S? So the last one is about spirituality and faith. And that's about what do you believe about the bigger issues of life? Do you have a relationship with your creator? And is this something that you want to make time for if you want to worship every week or, you know, whether it's your temple or your church or, you know, something like that? And is it important that your partner join you for this? Or is it important that you all, you know, have a spiritual life, a prayer, whatever that looks like for you? Or maybe someone is totally agnostic and atheist and they want no part of that. Again, can you both give one another the space to practice as you see fit? Or is that a deal breaker for you? This is just an important distinction of like, you know, are we on the same page? Do we want similar things? Some people might say, I want you there in church every week next to me. And other people might say, you know, it's okay. This is my thing. And it's what I do. And I actually enjoy the time away on Sunday. And it's not important to me if you are there with me. And if you guys can get to a place of just agreeing on what that looks like, that can work. Again, it doesn't have to be identical. It has to be complementary. You know, Dave, I'm always surprised by how many people trivialize this. And in my estimation, it's one of the most important factors at all. I mean, your cornerstone belief system whatever that is, will have a trickle-down effect into your life that is beyond the ability to overestimate. I mean, every part of your life will be influenced by how you view the world, how you view yourself, how you view God and creation and eternity and faith. And what I've noticed is when people are not particularly spiritual, they don't necessarily go to church. They don't have a defined belief system. They're the ones who are often quick to trivialize what's going on in a potential significant other's mind and soul in that regard. In other words, oh, well, this person, you know, needs to go to church every Sunday or, you know, they grew up Muslim. I'm sure we can get them off of that because, you know, that's all a myth anyway. We can get them to stop believing just a little bit of, you know, re-education <laughs> and they'll lose that faith and then we can go on our merry way. And I think that's a very dangerous mindset to have because it's never that easy. I mean, certainly people who have, dare I say, stricter religious codes, uh, you know, they can be influenced to slip, but then they experience guilt and they experience shame over that. And then you have a partner who's weighted down by that emotionally. And that, of course, is yet another rock you can throw on the pile of things that kill relationships. So yeah, huge, huge factor. Spirituality. You got to have at least a similar, if not almost, dare I say, identical belief system that guides how you live and how you make decisions or else there's going to be manipulation. There's going to be influences that are seen as a negative 
and perhaps even aggressive confrontation to one's whole lifestyle, to their whole being. Because when someone's spiritual, that's a part of who they are to their very soul. So it's got to match up, right? Yeah, exactly. I think that's a great way of saying when you choose a person, you also choose their beliefs, you choose their values, you choose their expectations. And, you know, that's either going to set you up to do really, really well, or it's going to eventually be one of those things that becomes the, you know, the chink in the armor that's going to eventually just really uh, create problems that are probably ultimately insurmountable at some point. It's about values at the end of the day, what's most important to people. Yeah, you bet. You know, the old stereotype, I mean, it's the oldest running joke in the world is that men choose women based on how hot their body is. And then women are saying, but he loves me for my mind. Well, I mean, if we as guys have a hard time bringing a woman's mind into the conversation when we're selecting a mate, just imagine how often we completely forsake considering her soul. (laughs) Absolutely. Mind, body, and soul. It's like the three dimensions of getting to know someone, and they're all pretty much equally important unless they're not to you, in which case you need to find someone who shares that very belief system. And I think that brings us full circle, always, A-L-L-W-A-Y-S. And I'll tell you, just to kind of wrap up this conversation, Dave, I think it's incredibly important that people even give some thought to the kind of person they'll find to be compatible with them before they just go off half-cocked finding another pretty face who will quote unquote put up with them. So I really appreciate the time and the effort and the intelligence that you've put into this because I think you're right on the money and I think you pretty much covered it. And with that, I want to go ahead and introduce these guys to your new book, which is called Same Shit, Different Date. So uh, tell guys a little bit about what they're going to encounter when they grab a copy of that off of Amazon. Awesome. Uh, so basically, the the title, Same Shit, Different Date, I make the point in the book that you might not be aware of this, but you're essentially those individual people that you dated that seem unique and different and totally different. There are probably, if you pull the string, there's probably things that connect them all. If you find yourself having you know similar issues, problems, challenges that keep coming up in different people, there's probably something that connects them. And what I do is I help you see where those recurring issues where that what they are, why they're happening, and basically how you can stop that from happening. I think it's a really fascinating book. I've gotten some great uh, response from people who've read it, and uh, it's a full, basically, an assessment that you can take, and you totally see. Oh my God, I never noticed what these people had in common. Uh, and so once you then realize, hey, here's the issue. Now I also give you a, a mechanism to totally change it, so you don't have to continue to get that lesson anymore. So it's a great vehicle if you find that relationships have been a place of challenge for you and you keep having like this you know same old shit happening again and again i'm going to help you figure out what it is exactly and then how you can fix it for good so i know the guys will love that because we we hate having the same old garbage again and again we just want to fix stuff you know so guys you just want to fix it you want to make it better you want to solve the problem check out this book And conveniently enough, you also have a practical workbook that goes along with it that you've cleverly named the companion piece, which I got to love. Right. It's a companion piece to the book, but it's actually companion piece, uh, piece as in P-E-A-C-E. Uh, so it's about like having peace with your companion, and then you can actually do this work. And again, the stuff that you'll get out of the book will really change the dynamic. If you see yourself like creating the same old, you know, dare I say, dysfunctional relationships or relationships that are ultimately aren't working and causing pain, uh, it's going to give you the mechanism that you can actually heal that stuff so that you can create a relationship where there is peace and happiness between both parties. Outstanding. If you want to go ahead and grab a copy of both Same Shit, Different Date and the companion piece, I've put both of them on my Amazon influencer page, which you can get to by going to www.mountaintoppodcast.com front slash Amazon. And if you want to bypass all that and go straight to the book and grab a copy, go to www.mountaintoppodcast.com front slash same S-A-M-E, where you will find Dave Elliott's book, grab a copy, and never make the mistake of getting into the wrong relationship with the wrong person ever again. And on that note, Dave, I want to thank you so much for bringing such great, powerful content to the show today. Thank you so much. Oh, man, totally my pleasure. Thank you so much. I enjoyed the time, too. Always great to spend time with a fellow Baltimorean. 
Yeah, man. It looks like you've really put some mind, body, and soul into your work, and I think the guys really appreciated it. And gentlemen, if you have not yet visited www.mountaintoppodcast.com, you're going to find all sorts of goodies when you get there. It is now 2020. First order of business, get on the phone with me for 25 minutes where we talk about where you are right now and where you want to be, how to get the right woman into your life. If you've seen these patterns over and over where you're just not getting the kind of women you really want, you're not in the relationship you want to be in. If you're not in the place you want to be in, in terms of your career, in terms of the adventures you're having, all of that is intertwined. And that's why when we get on the phone for 25 minutes for free, we can sort all of that out and perhaps put a plan of action together that makes sense for you. And most of all, gets you the results that you know you deserve. And that along with show notes, the YouTube version of the podcast, a full transcript, and a way to get on my daily newsletter and more are all there for you at www.mountaintoppodcast.com. And until I talk to you guys again real soon, this is Scott McKay from X and Y Communications in San Antonio, Texas. Be good out there. The Mountaintop Podcast is produced by X and Y Communications. All rights reserved worldwide. Be sure to visit www.mountaintoppodcast.com for show notes. And while you're there, sign up for the free X and Y Communications newsletter for men. This is Ed Roy Odom speaking for the Mountaintop Podcast. <laughs>